morning. Let's uh, uh, read from the Word, starting in Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 1 to 12. Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, who are in Colossae, or Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God our, and our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has come in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is faith, a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declare to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And then in Psalm 8. Well, we just read the whole Psalm. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you, you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for thy table this morning. We want to thank you for revealing yourself to us in it. We want to thank you for the grace that was bestowed to us through Jesus Christ in it. And for his being the one who brought us to you and reconciled us to you. Oh Lord, how can we not give you thanks and honor you and tell you that we love you because you love us so much. Now, Lord, as we come to the word today, we ask, how, how, how can we say anything that is from you? We can't. And so we look to you, Lord. We would open your word. We give it back to you and ask that you will um, bear witness to your son, Jesus. And in bearing witness, Lord, that it would open our, our, our hearts to him. Lord, it's not just our eyes that need to be opened. It's our hearts, too. And so we're asking for this, that your word by your spirit will be made known to us and we would see Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, uh, this morning, uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to speak on uh, Paul's prayer. But before I get to his prayer, there's really one part of the prayer that has really struck me. And I read the whole of... Colossians up to that thing because I think it sets his prayer. But when you look at uh, the verses in Colossians and Psalm Psalm eight, what we see 
even in Colossians, the whole book of Colossians, and I know we see Christ, but we see this also. We see man restored to his lost estate. And we saw in Psalm 8, we had what man was originally created for, to have dominion, to rule over the heavens and the earth, or the earth. And he forfeited that. He forfeited, he gave it all away. And um, through his having been redeemed now, through man's having been redeemed by Christ, he is now being used to bring Christ to his earthly throne where, he, where we will rule and reign with him. But man's been restored not in the old creation, not in the, the ones we were, but in a new man in Christ. And as those redeemed, we have a part in bringing him to his throne on earth. You know, if you look at it, the Lord is already seated on a throne in the heavenlies. He's already there, but he isn't seated here. And for us, our redemption has to do with bringing that man from the glory to here to rule and reign and restore what God had lost, all of it, by having man in dominion. And that man is now Christ. And so, from our fallen state, we lost something, but as being redeemed, we are brought into something big. And why is Paul praying uh, uh, for these people? You know, when you look at the beginning of Colossians, it seems like they're already, they already have it made. You know, you look at those first few verses, if you look at um, uh, verse... Um, Four, they have faith in Christ. They have love for all the saints. You know, they have a hope because they know what's been laid up for them in the heaven. And they've heard the word of the, uh, of the truth of the gospel and know it for being the truth. Why should they pray? Why should he pray for these people? They, they got it made. Okay, but he does pray. Because what I think uh, Paul is doing and praying for him, he's, he's bringing them into something bigger. And, uh, you know, I, I know that we are those, well, yeah, something bigger, and, and we think of eternal purpose, but it's true. And I want to sh- I want to show first, we talk about a bigger picture, because a lot of us, when we first came to the Lord, uh, we did not have a real big picture. We had a picture of of what God had done for us in Christ. But I want to show some things to bring uh, 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 to uh, our minds in a way we can see first. Because sometimes when we talk, it just, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other. Sometimes you just need a a picture. And so I want to use a a, a couple of things uh, to show us this. All right. So when you look at this, um, the Lord is trying to bring us into something bigger. And when we look at the, uh, things, it's a great picture, isn't it? You know what it is? It's my students when they find out that I don't give extra credit after I've given a test. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. This comes from uh, Michelangelo's altarpiece painting in the Sistine Chapel. Okay, great detail, isn't it? I mean, look at the emotion in the face, okay? But you know, if you just see this, you don't really get what the, what the picture is about. So you have to see it in context of the whole thing. Here's our person, okay? What's the context? Does anybody know what this painting is called? Shame on you. Your art history teachers are turning over. They're changing your transcripts right now. It's the last judgment. Okay? And it's all centered 
around the return of Christ. Here's Christ returning. But you see, you don't get that with just this. You have to see the bigger picture to understand the individual. You see what I'm saying? If you don't see the bigger picture, you're left with just the individual. And the Lord would not have us just be in that individual. He wants us in the bigger picture. Now I want to show you another thing, okay? Just to give us, again, this, this idea. Anybody know what this is? The Normandy invasion. Very good. Okay. Uh, these are the men that are getting ready to hit Omaha Beach. All right. But just this alone doesn't tell you anything. It's just a bunch of men in a boat. Okay. Even if I made a little say, okay, well, let's show you the invasion. Okay. There's the invasion. Well, it tells you a little more, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. You need the big picture. You know, when I teach, when I teach history, I teach the big picture. Because if you don't know the big picture, the other parts don't fit well. You don't know how they fit. And you need to know how you fit in to the big picture. Okay, because if it's only just about you, you've, you've lost real uh, uh, context of what your salvation is all about. And so if you look at this, I mean, we, to understand this picture... To really understand the context of this picture, you have to go all the way back to this. Okay? Well, and that's not finished, okay? And then you can see there, we've got Hitler, and then we've got all the territory that the Germans had conquered up until 1942. Do you, you see that? I mean, you look at this, and you look at a map. I mean, it's out of the textbook, you know, but you look at the map and look at what was conquered. Look what was under the dominion of Hitler. This was neutral, so it doesn't count. Okay? This was neutral, so it doesn't count. This was under fire. Okay? And so was the Soviet Union. Now, that's not it, okay? Now, we're putting the picture in context. Okay? We see that all of this has taken place and now this comes into being. And to give us the bigger picture, we have this whole thing. And you'll notice, once this came into being, look at what happens. Let's keep it in the context. You get this nice headline so that explains this. Allied armies land in France. Great invasion is underway. But that's not the end. This was the goal of it. You see what I'm saying? Here, even in this one picture, you have to know a beginning and you have to know a future. You have to know a past and you have to know a future to put everything into context. Okay, but you have to know, you will never know the importance of these things unless you put it, here's a nice little collage, right? And if you go, we're reading in English now, left to right and then left to right. Okay, don't go up and down if you're Chinese. Okay, we're going left to right. <laughs> left to right, okay. But the whole thing is, this is the whole context of everything. You see it all together. It makes sense. This, all of this, gives this meaning. Do you understand? And that's what's happening here. When Paul begins to talk to these, uh, or uh, uh, Epaphras comes and he starts to tell uh, Paul about the Colossians. And he gives a great report, don't you think? It's a wonderful report. Now, they are under attack. We know that. They're under attack. They're, they're being uh, uh, in danger of having everything robbed from them. All right? And so Paul then uh, begins to pray. Right? And what he does is his prayer begins that we would know the will of God. All right? That's it. That they would know the will of God. Now, um, my little goody didn't come out because it should have been hidden. Okay? You're not supposed to be seeing this. So pretend that you're not. 
But let me just put it this way, okay? If you look at it, what is the will of God? This is the big picture. That Christ might have his rightful place. That is the big picture of the will of God for us. That is the big picture of the will of God for the universe, for the cosmos. This is the will of God. Now, we can take it and we can bring it down and say, okay, what do you mean his rightful place? His rightful place in our personal beings. Notice I said beings. I didn't say our personal lives. It's our being, which is more than our life. It's who we are, okay? That he has his rightful place in the center of our being. That he has his rightful place in our believing communities, in our assemblies, in the places where we live in fellowship with other believers, that he has his rightful place when two or three are gathered in his name. And then finally, that he has his rightful place on earth and in the whole cosmos, in all of creation, he is to have his rightful place. Now, when we look at these things, now I put it in order as most of us would do. We put ourselves first, right? Or you could say, well, I went from smallest to largest, right? Okay? But let me tell you something. Like I said, when I teach history, I teach the big picture first. Because none of these other things make sense because they're not meant to stand alone, make sense without this. You look at events in history, you go, well, this is an event. But if you take it just as itself, it means nothing unless you see it in the bigger context. You know, you, you don't understand why there was a revolution in Russia unless you understand that how they were uh, running World War I or how they uh, ran their uh, uh, czar, uh, their czarist regime. You have to know the bigger picture. And then you can see the event and you can say, aha, now I understand why Lenin promised peace, bread, and land. It makes sense now. Otherwise, it's just a slogan. And so we generally, we get stuck not here, but we get stuck here. This is where we start out. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Okay? I'm not saying it's wrong. And don't think that it's wrong. But there's more. That's what you have to understand. There's more. It's not just that I'm saved from sin. It's not just that I'm saved from sin and then I do good things and live a good life. Because that's what most Christians believe. And that's not altogether wrong. But you have to look at it in the context that it's supposed to be in. We've been saved. We've been redeemed. That Christ might have first place in the cosmos and the earth first in our communities. I mean, that's why we're saved. Now, yeah, we look at it from the other way. But the thing is, when God set his plan in motion, it was the big picture first. And then we are brought into it. See, we're brought in to the big picture. We are painted in to the big picture. For example, let's see. Where is he? See this guy right here? See this right here? That's his skin. He's taken it off. This is Michelangelo. He painted himself into the picture. Okay. Why is he taking off the old skin? Old man's getting done away with. You've got to see the big picture. Christ returns. Old things are past. It's a wonderful thing that we've been brought into. And so when Paul begins to um, pray for these people, his first prayer is that they know the will of God. And the will of God is this greater thing. He's saying, brothers and sisters, I want you to know into what a great thing you've been called into. And I want to say something about the, 
this great thing. Number one is when you're brought into something great, you begin to summon the things, you start looking for things inside you that justify you being brought into this. You know that? We all do that. Why have I been brought into this? Where's the greatness in me that's supposed to rise to the occasion of this great calling? Well, you know what we find out when we start looking inside? We find this. We find that old man, and an old man has nothing. There's nothing in it. There's no life in it. There's nothing. There's nothing that I have to be in this calling. Nothing. And, but you say, well, gee whiz, then why did the Lord show me? Don't you remember the Sermon on the Mount? What's the first thing the Lord Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? I'm listening. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Right. Why? Why are they blessed? Okay, so there's nothing in it. I don't look at that as being very blessed. Because I have someone now to turn to. Because otherwise I would never turn to him. And so when we look at this, we brought into this, and this is what Paul wants to show them. You've been brought into something great. And you start going, well, I'm pretty good. I've been brought into something great. This is wonderful. And then you go, why did he choose me? Then you get, you're get you brought into uh, places where you're supposed to be and, and doing things for the kingdom of God. You look within yourself, and there's nothing in you that can bring these things to pass. What do you do? You look to God. Because God is our salvation. You know, our salvation, you know, our salvation isn't that our sins are forgiven. Our salvation is God. God's our salvation because forgiveness of sins is with him. You know, judgment's with him. He is our salvation. And so we find that there's a poverty of spirit and uh, we... Look to God to help us out, to come in and reign in us. So then, it's not our aspiring to do something that lifts us to great things. But it's our being called from on high to be part of a work that's so much greater than us that it brings us to see our own bankruptcy and doing anything to bring it about and our turning to God. Makes us able to look to God. And that's why the, we would pray like the psalmist. In Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Now, you know, if we stopped right there, that's so forlorn, isn't it? Where does my help come from? But he finishes that same verse by saying, it comes from thee who made heaven and earth. And so we are brought into this place to the first thing Paul wants us to know, I want you to know his will. Because his will is a great thing. It's a great purpose that you've been brought into, and I want you to know it so you can get to the place of saying, I have nothing. Now, now that we know his will, he goes, I want you to know his will, but it's not just I know his will as if like, okay, I know it, what's next? Because that's what we do, right? Oh, I, I learned that. What's next? Oh, we studied Colossians. What's next? You know what I mean? We're in that type of place. I mean, that's what we are. But he says, it's not that I just want you to know his will and the big picture his will. But I want you to know it in all, spiritual, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In other words, uh, we want to know his will. He wants us to know this will, this purpose, so that we can order our lives to be in line with that purpose. Okay? Now, it's not left on our own to order our lives. Okay? So don't think I'm saying, oh, yeah, you're going to work for it and everything's going to be okay. 
<clears throat> so it's not just the spiritual truth we're after, but it's, and it's not to know just for the sake of knowing truth. Okay, I know that. I'll notch my belt. Now, where does this wisdom come from? Yep. Okay. You know, wisdom, you know, we say wisdom comes from God, but okay, where do we get God's wisdom? We get it from his word. Okay, we get it from his word. And it's not just that, you know, we have a quiet time and all of a sudden things just pop out at us, okay? And we've got to get through, through to this, um, that things are not like we just sit around and things come to us. Everything's just given to us, all right? You remember uh, Isaac? When Isaac was waiting around in the, in the land, he was going to leave because there was a famine, Right? And God stopped him from going to Egypt. And he said, stay here. And uh, like to say, Isaac, everything you need is provided in this land. So it's not like Isaac said, okay, show me. I want to see corn sprout up out of it. Just like you did in creation. You spoke it into being. Let's see it, God. No, what do you find Isaac doing in chapter, I think it's 26 of Genesis. He plants, he digs wells, he does these things. And you know, I think our mindset is that uh, we're, we're becoming to be welfare Christians, expecting everything to be given to us, and we do nothing for it. All right? And that's, that's something, especially you guys that are second generation and third generation, you know, I teach once in a while, uh, when I teach U.S. history, I teach the civil rights movement. And I scold my kids, especially my African-American kids. I scold them. I say, you know something? You don't even realize how your grandparents suffered so you could be here. You've lost that, and everything now is given to you because of what they've done. Well, what are you doing to make sure of that dream? You know, you're expecting everything to be given to you? Now, the word. We get it through his word, and that means we have to engage ourselves in the word. That means that I don't just read it and then put it over and say, well, I've read the word for today, and I can go on and do it the rest of my life. Engage. Do you guys engage in conversation with your parents? You know, how many of us really engage in someone else? You know what it means to engage in somebody? If I'm talking to Jerry, I'm looking him in the eye, and I'm letting him read me, and he's letting me read him, unless he doesn't want to, he'll look down, okay, or look away. But you, you see what I'm talking about by being engaged? All right? When I went after my wife, okay, I had to engage her before I got engaged. You, you, know, you know what I mean? I had to see into her and let her see into me. And when we're engaged in the word of God, we're letting God look into us through his word. And he's letting us look at him so that we can see who he is because he is revealed in his word. You have to look for him. You have to be engaged. And then you have to have a desire to find him. And you have to have a desire to be found out by him. If you want to know, if you want to be brought into this big picture, you've got to open yourself up to God and let him open himself up to you by opening the word, prayerfully reading it. Oh, you know, I tell you, there's a big fault with me there. It's so easy to not prayerfully read the word and just look things up for a message or something like that. I can go to a commentary, I can go, but prayerful reading. A prayerful reading is the part where we're saying, God, you have to show me. You have to let me see. You have to reveal yourself to me because my mind is not going to be able to fathom you. Study. You study the word. 
You don't just read it and close the book like you do your textbooks and then get AP notes. All right? Yeah, yeah. you guys know what I'm talking about, huh? Yeah. Okay. No, you study it. You know, a lot of us, we don't, we don't study anymore. I mean, even us older people, when we go to the Word, we go, we don't study it. We'll go, we'll read it, and we'll have fellowship over it. But we won't study it. But you know, you need to study I'm not making a, 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 a please, don't, don't think that. But I'm just saying, if you're going to come to have fellowship over the Word, let it be intelligent. Study the word, see what it says, see what is, what is in context. Have you read the book Colossians? Have you read that letter and seen what it's talking about in its entirety? Because this whole thing, when you, when you say, well, these people are brought low, the next thing he does and when he starts in verse uh, 13 is he starts bringing people to Christ. The rest of the book is about how big Christ is and being brought to Christ, and you need Christ. All of that is there, and you cannot bring Christ back to his throne here on earth without Christ in you. And then you need to reflect on the word. Reflect on it, to think about it. How many of you guys are going to eat today without chewing I'm going to watch. You know, like snakes. You know, just go and your mouth gets bigger and goes around it, okay? You chew. You know something what happens when you chew? You get the flavor of the food. It smooshes it down, and you get all that juice stuff, right? And it goes in and it mixes with your taste buds. It touches your taste buds, and your taste buds goes, man, that's pretty cool. Okay? You chew it. You allow it to be broken down so that you can not only swallow it, but it can be assimilated into your life. Because if you don't chew it, it's just going to be wait, go out the waste door. You know? It's got to be digested. And you know what? When you do this, when you give yourself to God and the Word in this way, God by His Spirit then is able to direct our thoughts a certain passage, to think about a certain word, to think about a certain event that's happened in there, something that God now has you, and he's able to direct you, and he sustains your energy because your interest has been peaked. He sustains your energy so you can hold that word and take it in and get the full benefit of it, and then it can become light to you and revelation. So you need the word to break through so it becomes that light and revelation. Otherwise, we just read it and it's nothing. It's a textbook. But it's meant to show us who God is. It's meant to reveal God to us and it's meant to give us life. So his word. Secondly, it says, through spiritual understanding. Oh, what's spiritual understanding? That's a... That's a big word, right? Spiritual understanding. That's the word being quickened or made alive or made, uh, how can I say, translated to you so you know what it means. And not that it's something that you know what it means so you can store it in a box, but you know you can, what it means so it can be applied to your life, to your life situation, to uh, uh, your knowledge of God, Okay? so that you might, your knowledge of God, now listen, your knowledge of God that might lead you to faith. It might lead you to believe that he is who he says he is. And if he's asked you to do something, he is able to give you success in it. That's what spiritual understanding is. Now, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be doing this, aren't I? Sorry, I just got caught up. See, I really didn't need this except for the pictures, didn't I? Okay. And it says uh, to put our part, to, 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 to get our part in this grandiose purpose then, 
He wants us to know his will. Why? So that we might walk worthy. Now, when I'm talking about walk worthy, I'm not talking about earning something. I'm not talking about having a holiness that gets us points with God. But when we talk about walking worthy, if we went back to those pictures of those soldiers, you know, um, to walk worthy. If you're going to be a soldier in service, what does it mean to walk worthy? Well, yeah, sure, you have to obey orders, but more than that, it means that, um, well, let's give it the negative side first. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, don't be entangled in the affairs of this life. That's to walk worthy. It's to know that you've been called to something higher that you can put those things aside and say, I'm not going to entangle myself in that because I've been brought into a higher purpose. You think about this, okay? When those soldiers got drafted into the army, or some of them actually enlisted, they went off to those camps, okay? And they were set, set apart for that purpose. And they then, you know, when they went on leave and stuff like uh, that, they were not going to get themselves entangled in those other things because they saw that they were called to something greater and defending the free world. Those men were defending the free world. Well, what about us? We're called to bringing Christ down to have his throne on earth. How much higher can you go? You can't. But that's our calling. Don't be sidetracked away from the purpose. Don't be caught up in your own self-interest. That's the negative side in 2 Timothy. Also, to walk worthy means to submit to the training. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11 talks about uh, us being under discipline. And it's for us to submit to training. Why do we submit to training? It's because you're pre being prepared for good works. You're being prepared for something that's going to help bring in the king. And so you have to submit to training. You might, even not, you might not even know why it's good, but the one who is training you, the Holy Spirit who lives in you, is training you for something. You know, I, I uh, played basketball in college, and uh, you have a coach and you have an assistant coach. Your uh, coach makes all the plans, and your assistant coach goes out and carries, sees that they're carried out. Okay? And uh, basketball season starts uh, at the end of November. Well, it did in the 1970s. And... Um, School started after Labor Day. And so from Labor Day until, what was it, October 15th? Yeah, it was October 15th. You had, it's called conditioning. We're basketball players, but we cannot touch a basketball. So what do we do? We ran. We ran. And we ran. And after that, we ran. And then we had one hill that we run, run twice a week, Bass and Cherry Boulevard in Fullerton, California. Steady upgrade for about a mile. Killer. And you would think, like, is this guy trying to kill us? Because in September, October, you get the Santa Ana winds and stuff like that. Is this guy trying to kill us? And Coach Sims, who was the assistant coach, after we ran that, would be doing calisthenics and doing leg lifts. You guys remember leg lifts? Oh. So after you've run that, you know, now you're doing leg lifts. And, it, and Coach Sims would go, do you know why you're doing this? Yeah, you're torturing us. No. He said, because when it comes to be February, you're going to be running circles around your opponents. And you know something? I didn't think of it then. I just thought, I just want this to get over. I can't wait till October 15th comes so we can be in the gym. But you know, in February, we were running circles around our opponents. 
And you know when you're trained like that and you, and you fall into the, the discipline of that training and you give yourself to it, you give yourself to that one who's disciplining you, you find that then that you can believe him. Because he brings you into those circumstances that you said, this is the training for. How many of those guys who hit that beach on Omaha Beach, you know, it was the training of the, knowing how their gun works. The training of, uh, of, of being uh, together as a group, of working together. All that training, they got them ready for that one time. They thought, like, these guys are nuts. These DIs, these drill instructors are crazy. But when it came down to being under fire, all of a sudden, they, all those things came right into being. And they were the very things that were needful for that time. And the very things that were needed to bring in that VE day, which was the final thing. All of that was necessary, and you had to, they, they gave themselves to it. Now, there's a positive side to all of this, too. It says that there's, there's fruitfulness. There we go. Fruitfulness. And fruitfulness comes from carrying out orders. You do what you're told to do. And to put that in our, our Christian vernacular, it means that there's an obedience that you give to the Lord. And it's not just an obedience of commands. These are the commands you obey them. It's an obedience of that Lord speaking to you, within you, from the word, making those things alive to you, and you obey them when they come to you. When that rhema, that word for that day, that word for that time comes to you, you obey it. And when you do that, you find out that God is true. And fruit is born out of that. In other words, what the Lord had planted in you for that time comes to full fruition. It's ripened. And it's ready for others to taste. You never, an apple tree never eats its own apples. Okay? But those passing by do. And whether it be those of the household of God or those that are not saved, the fruit is there because you've gone under the training and you've been the obedient servant. You've been that obedient soldier and you're there for that time. Uh, obedience carries the sentence of death. How many of those guys, I don't know how many of you guys watched uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. You know, when they were going up in those ships, that first wave, and you heard all that pinging on that front door you know, that, uh, that LST, you heard all that pinging, and as soon as that dropped, all those first guys are dead. And the thing is, for us, when there's an obedience, when there's obedience to the order, there is a death, and it's a death to self. There's a death to self that has to happen for that fruit to come forth. You know, from the ground, there blossoms red. Life that shall endless be. Unless a grain of corn falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Something happens. Okay? Now, some obey and they find out, or they obey because they consider themselves already dead. This, for example, a uh, I, I watch war movies. I'm sorry. If you watched, uh, what is it, Band of Brothers? It's a great, great one. So they go into D Day. There's one guy who does all these heroic things and almost insane things. He runs into enemy fire and all these things. And he comes back and he goes, Why are you doing that? And it happens that when he does them, it, it, it frees up some things and it helps them to win. And somebody finally asked him, he goes, what are you doing that? He goes, I've considered myself already dead, so why try and save my life? I'll just go and do these things, and if God lets me live, he lets me live. And he did, he lived through the whole war. It's incredible. But that's kind of like being a bond servant. That's like saying, I'm dead. I'm dead to myself, I'm dead to my life. I don't want to live anymore. I want to live for Christ. You know, not all of us are there. Because some of us are still entangled. Some of us are still thinking about ourselves. But through obedience comes epignosis, knowledge, true knowledge, 
real knowledge, knowledge, experiential knowledge of God. We see that God is real. We see that God is powerful. Uh, we see that he is faithful. We see that his plans really were the best plans. Like in Romans, it talks about, you know, that we can understand that uh, his plans are good. In Romans 12, too, nobody reads that one, but you need to read that. You want to say, I want to, re- I want to read that part, too. Okay? <clears throat> and we also see his love. We see his love for us. We see his love for the world. We see his love for the saints. We see his love for his son. All of these. And because you see the big picture, now you can care for the other people in your unit. Because you're all put together to accomplish the same thing. And it's because of that that you see you need one another as brothers and sisters in this. And that you are a part of a body and you're all under one head. And you're all going for the same purpose. None of us are called to a different purpose. We're all called to bring Christ back to earth. All of us are called to that. Now, we might have something else we do. You might be uh, uh, led to be a teacher or a housewife or a doctor or whatever. But we're all, that's just a, 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 a kind of a worldly vocation. But our true calling is to bring the Lord back. That's the true purpose for our being saved. It's nothing less than that. Nothing less than that. And so, and then it says that we're to be strengthened, okay? Well, what are we going to be strengthened for? It says, well, we're going to be strengthened for all patience and long-suffering. And all that Paul is saying is, I'm praying for you because the ride is not going to be smooth. Don't expect a smooth ride. There are bumps along the road. It's like uh, a mountain road, you know, a mountain road that hasn't been paved. Have you ever driven one of those? Those are so cool because you're bouncing all around. It's so really cool. But the thing is, you know, it's not going to be smooth. Uh, those of us that are parents, hey, how many of you guys that are parents, okay? You guys are father, it's Father's Day, right? Dads, hey, how many of you hadn't had any problems being a father? Mac, really? That's interesting. I'll talk, to, I'll talk to your wife afterwards. Okay? But the thing is, you know, all of life has problems. We are not going to have a, 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 a road that is smooth. There are parts of it that will be smooth, but there are other parts that will be rocky. You know, we talk about the, the 23rd Psalm. Oh, yeah, I like being green pastures by still waters. That's cool. But what about the part where he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death? Who put that in that psalm? God did. Okay? Because he knows. Um, there's an enemy that doesn't want this, this big purpose to happen. And he's out to stop it. He won't. But he's out to stop it. And he's out to wreak havoc. You know, even the Germans, you know, you look at the Germans uh, uh, in uh, uh, World War II, uh, or even the Japanese, toward the end of the war, they knew they were losing. Did, that, did they just give up? No, some of them even fought even harder. You know, you look at the taking of like Okinawa. You know, yeah, Okinawa, right? Okay, it took what, three months to take that. Three months to take that island. Very bloody, because those guys just held in tooth and nail in caves and everything. You had to go, in Stalingrad, the building, the Stalingrad, they had to take the uh, city building by building, room by room. What makes us think that it's going to be easy for us? You know? Also, another thing is, not every one of us is in the same place. Some of us are just being trained in this way. Some of us have more experience. Okay? Uh, and, and you know, some of us, especially when we're young, we think we know everything. I'll show you how this is done. And we have to wait for them. We have to wait until they come to the saying, saying, you know, something, I was wrong. You're right, brother, you were. Now let's go on. Let's get on. All right? So there's an enemy against it. There's an adversary. Um, and you have to learn to find Christ in the bumpy road. And you know where you find Christ? Yeah, you go, well, in the Word, Jim. Yeah, okay. Well, no, it's, you find Christ also in your brothers and sisters. 
You know, when you're going through bumpy roads and stuff like that, and you're in that unit and you're fighting, what do you look for? You're looking for hope and you're looking for help in other people. And you find Christ in others. And you're supposed to be looking for Christ in others. Where is Christ? Where is he? Where is that word from Christ? Oh, it's coming from him? Ah, oh, but I smell Christ. I don't like the brother, but what he just said, that's Christ. You know what I mean? And then it also says, you know, we're not just left to the idea that it's going to be bumpy, but it says strengthen uh, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Now, we're strengthened with his might, but you know something else? We're also strengthened with joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, we're able to go on. We're able to be strengthened also because we have a joy that can't be taken away from us. We know the victory is ours. In the end, the victory is ours. And we have to look forward to that victory. And, you know, I don't want to say name and claim it, but there's sometimes we do. We have to look at it and say, Lord, it's yours. Now, in closing, we look at this thing and we say, who is able to do this stuff? Because like I said, we, we, we come to a place and we see this great thing and we're, we go, who's going who's gonna to do this? Well, that's where we look at verse 13 where it says this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness or the d- domain of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, the son of his love, in whom we have redemption uh, through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So once we get to the end and we see what this big purpose is and we see what we're called to and we start to shrink back because we don't think we have what Paul turns us right to Christ. And the first thing he says is he's qualified you. You're not 4F. You know, I was disqualified from the draft. Well, you know why? Too good looking. <laughs> no, 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 no. They don't want, they want, they don't want to see a good looking guy killed. No. Uh, I have a crooked back, so I can't uh, uh, stand for long periods of time uh, with a big, big 20 pound pack on. Can't march uh, 20 miles with a 20 pound pack. But the thing is, he's qualified us. Well, how has he qualified us? Well, first of all, by forgiving our sins. There's nothing against us. You know, it's like going into that physical and, and passing fully. You have nothing wrong with it. Your eyesight's good. Your hearing's good. You don't have flat feet. Everything's working in order because Christ is in you. And that's the other thing. You go, well, how can I do these things? In verse 22, I'm sorry, not verse 22, verse 27, to them God will to make uh, known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, this is the whole thing in a nutshell. How can we bring Christ back? The only way we can do it is if the new man lives in us. That's the only way. And we should rejoice because he has put Christ in us. Not only have we been put in Christ, but Christ has been put in us. Why? To live to live so he can bring back the throne to God. So brothers and sisters, when we look at Paul's prayers, it's not just that uh, uh, he's satisfied with just saying, you know, the, the, these, these guys have all they need. He says, I want to bring them higher. I want you to see the highness of things. Because it's when you see the highness and you see that you don't have anything left, but you see what's been provided you, it ennobles you. You watch any kid who makes a team, he might thought, I'm not very good, but you give him a uniform, you watch the chest puff out. There's an ennobling by knowing that you're called to something great. And it's all you do is you come back to God and you humbly bow down before him and you say, oh Lord, thank you. Your will be done. It's just like Mary when she was told she was going to have the Christ. But how can these things be? I've never known man before. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. And what did she say? 
then Lord, may it be done to your maidservant as you've said. That's what we should be saying. As we see, as, as we see ourselves brought into this big purpose, let us shrink back only because we see in ourselves there's nothing there. But having seen that then, let us come forward to the throne of grace and receive that grace for this time of need, for this time that we're in, that his will can be done and that he might be brought back to his throne and all things be given back to Christ and Christ gives them all back to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just want to thank you that you brought us into something great. And Lord, I know we shrink from it. We say, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. But Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that you, by the word of God and by the spirit of God, would give us from that word, that word that gives us faith to say yes. Uh, I don't see it in me, but yes, Lord, you said that I've been called into this purpose. I've been called into the fellowship of your son for all these purposes. Lord, I want to be in the ranks of the redeemed in this way. I ask that you'll do this for all of us in Jesus Christ's name.